Greetings, friends and Firebirds fans, and welcome to the Fire and Ice podcast presented by Desert Willow Golf Resort, coming to you from Palm Desert, California, a mere Layton Road, well, road away from the Bird's Home Ice, and right down the street from Acrisure Arena. I'm your host, Judd Spicer, along with this bi-monthly endeavor over the course of the Firebirds sophomore season. Also, again, have the privilege and the pleasure of serving as your Firebirds insiders. Those articles may be found online at cvfirebirds.com. And, of course, that's your home and your host for all things Coachella Valley Firebirds, including, but certainly not limited to, team, roster, staff, community, merchandise, tickets to games, or may I editorialize, playoff games soon to take place at Acrisure Arena. For those tickets and the parking, might I also suggest downloading the handy CV Firebirds application on your mobile device. Per those aforementioned articles, the last of which, for those following along over the course of this season, most recent one was Firebirds are poised for the playoffs, meaning the next article will be Firebirds preview versus Question mark. Yeah, we've reached that point. The regular season, regular season number two, now in the books. And we wait. We got a little downtime between games as the Firebirds, of course, earned that buy by virtue of winning the Pacific Division. Here to discuss as much in this episode. You know him, you love him. Firebirds alternate captain center Andrew Podoralski is going to be joining me shortly on this episode of fire and ice. Of course, this program would not be powered in full without the good people over at Desert Willow Golf Resort, right here, also in sunny Palm Desert, California, mere three plus miles away from Akersha Arena, home to the Fire Cliff and Mountain View courses, respectively. You can get those tee times online at desertwillow.com, also home to the awesome and on site Palm Desert Golf Academy for those looking for a little extra swing tutelage. And may I add, just as the Firebirds season finds crescendo as we ready for the playoffs, so does Desert Willow. The upcoming City of Palm Desert Championship that's taking place on Memorial Day weekend, right around the corner, Saturday, May 25, and Sunday, May 26. Pair of rounds, multiple flights, and again, two rounds taking place, both of them on the Mountain View course Two-player team event open to both Palm Desert residents and non-residents alike. You can find more on the City of Palm Desert Championship also at DesertWillow.com. All right, Firebirds friends. That's a golf tournament. Let's talk about a hockey tournament because that's essentially what the Calder Cup playoffs will bring forth. And I think I speak for not just myself and my fellow media members, but for many of those listening and for many of whom fill the 10,000-plus seats at Acrisure Arena and are sure to do so come this postseason. We've been thirsting for this. We've been readying for this for quite a long time. Of course, the Birds clinched a playoff spot about a month ago. I think that was March 23. We clinched the um, first place in the Pacific Division, which again comes with the accompanying first-round bye. We did that about two weeks ago. Shortly thereafter, the Birds clinched the best record in the Western Conference. And yes, these postseason games, I think, are something, again, I feel comfortable speaking for more than myself, that we've all been itching for and waiting for, hungering for, for quite some time. And now it's here, second season in the books, and the playoffs are afoot. Let's take a step back here in our Firebirds freeze frame portion of the Fire and Ice podcast. Just a brief look at what was and what will be. As now noted a few times, of course, the Firebirds finished in first place in the Pacific Division, earned them a bye in the first round. Here are the teams that qualified for the playoffs that did not earn a bye, respective matchups in these three Pacific Division first round best of three series get underway this week, this Wednesday, April 24th. Tucson Roadrunners, they finished in second place, earning the number two seed. They will play our old friends, the Calgary Wranglers, the seventh seed in the best of three. The third place, Ontario Reign, 
going to face off against the Bakersfield Condors. More on that series in a moment. That also gets underway. All these series get underway, I should say, Wednesday, April 24th. And then fourth place, Colorado, by virtue of a win on the final day of the season over Ontario. They earned the four seed in their best of three versus uh, fifth place, Abbotsford Canucks. The Tucson and Calgary series, all three of those games, again, game three if necessary, in a best of three, will take place in Tucson. The Colorado versus Abbotsford series will find all three games again if number three is needed in Colorado. But a little quirk in the Ontario versus Bakersfield series, game one, Wednesday, April 24th again, uh, that has taken place at Ontario. Game two, however, in that series is going to involve a little travel. Uh, Saturday, April 27th, Ontario at Bakersfield. And then if need be for Game 3, Bakersfield will return to Ontario on Sunday, April 28th. And yeah, I realize we're getting to both some of the nuts and the bolts of this, but this is important, and I'm going to tell you why. The Firebirds will face the lowest remaining seed come the second round, the Pacific Division semifinals, which is a best of five. That means our four potential opponents for round two are Colorado, Abbotsford, Bakersfield, and Calgary. I think that we can probably cross uh, cross out Calgary. They have not had a very good season. They didn't score a lot of goals. They get a lot of penalty minutes. And yes, they did get last year's MVP, Dustin Wolf, back between the pipes for the postseason. But I don't think they have any chance versus Tucson, so I'm basically crossing them out. This season versus Colorado, they gave us some trouble. However, they have a lot of players that got called up to the Avalanche, and the Avalanche, the big boy club for the Colorado Eagles, did qualify for the NHL playoffs. Avalanche are currently facing Winnipeg in round one, which is notable in that the Birds were a mere 1-2-1 and one versus Colorado this season, and we haven't played them since back on February 17th. A record versus potential opponent Abbotsford, that was much, much better. Birds went 5-0-2-1 versus the Canucks this season. Also did well against a pesky Bakersfield club, did the Firebirds. CV went 4-1-2-1 over the course of this season versus Bakersfield. Of further note... Abbotsford's parent club, of course, Vancouver. They made the NHL playoffs. They are playing Nashville in the first round. Bakersfield, uh, Bakersfield's parent NHL club, the Edmonton Oilers, they also qualified for the NHL playoffs. They are facing the LA Kings in round one. And as we learned a valuable last year, uh, lesson last year, Firebirds friends, got to keep tabs on which parent clubs are making the playoffs. For instance, Tucson's did not. I want to say that It was Arizona. Of course, they're not in Arizona anymore. However, by virtue of Arizona, now Utah, not making the NHL playoffs, Tucson has gotten five players back for their AHL playoff run. A little more on this per the format. All right. This is, I'm going to call this an educated guess. Some of this is published in public knowledge. Some of it, not necessarily. If the Bakersfield Condors were to, I guess you could say, upset, they are the sixth seed, if they were to upset the third seed Ontario Reign, that series for the Firebirds would take place based on AHL rules and the proximity rules, which we learned about in the postseason last year. A series versus Bakersfield would take on the format of a 2-2-1, whereby the first two games would take place at Akershire Arena. We would travel to Bakersfield for two games if need be, and again, if necessary, a Game 5 would take place back here at Akershire Arena. In the other two series, and again, I'm discounting Calgary in all of this, if we were to face either Colorado or Abbotsford, both of whom I think we can say is the lowest remaining seed, are more likely opponents, those would take on two or three formats And regular listeners and Firebirds friends will remember that's what happened last year in our second round series versus Colorado. Took on the 2-3 format. That was the Firebirds' choice by virtue of having the better record. The first two games were in Colorado. The latter three games, all of which were needed, came back to Akershire Arena. I very much trust, again, this filed under educated guess, that if we were to play either Colorado or Abbotsford, 
in a 2-3 format, Birds again would likely choose that same scenario whereby the first two games would be on the road and then the final three games, if necessary, would take place here in Palm Desert. As for said playoff games for the Birds of any kind, yeah, we're going to be waiting for a spell. CV is probably going to have about nine, potentially ten days off as they await their second round opponent. And again, if we get that 2-3 format whereby the first two games would be away, we could have about two weeks before we see hockey being played again after the Firebirds' uh, regular season uh, concluded versus San Diego on Sunday the 21st. Between that game and our first home playoff game, yeah, it could be quite a spell before we see hockey again here in the desert. So be patient. Get ready. I trust many of you will be following what's going on uh, in action for these other series. And then, again, collecti uh, collectively readying for the return of live playoff hockey back here to the desert. All right, a few other sundries I want to uh, throw at you. And this is a little bit more than I usually throw in our Firebirds freeze frame segment, but it is kind of the, it's the regular season epilogue. And, again, we've got some downtime until hockey is going to be played for the birds again. Pretty amazing season, the arc of it all told, friends. If you recall and harken back to October, November, a 9-7 and seven start, a mere 9-7 and seven start for the birds. Some could call it a little bit funky. Things turned around quickly come the turn of the 2024 calendar. Firebirds ultimately accrued points in 23 of the team's last 25 games. Regular season record concluded at 46, 15, 6-5, six totaling 103 points in the standings. Sound familiar? Well, that's exactly how many points the Firebirds, the Firebirds earned last year in the inaugural season. Uh, the record and point total, I should say, uh, best in the West, top in the pack. We've established that. Second best, ultimately, in the AHL, behind only, yeah, you know what, the Hershey Bears, who are on the doorstep of a historic AHL uh, point total or win percentage season ultimately fell up, uh, fell, I want to say, one win or one point short of achieving that. But they did ultimately end up with the best record in the American Hockey League. Uh, Firebirds finished with the most goals in the Western Conference, 252. That was five fewer than last year. Also allowed the fewest goals in the Western Conference at 182. That is a dozen fewer goals allowed in the regular season than last year's team. A couple attendance numbers for you. The AHL set a league record this season, just shy of 7 million fans, the specific number. 6,822,875 fans attended AHL games this year. Birds finished with the fifth most average fans uh, in the American Hockey League. That was second best in the Western Conference, only to last place uh, Chicago over in the Central. Uh, Birds averaged 8,844 fans per game here in this second season. Swiftly on to the players, again, one of whom we'll speak with shortly, Andrew Podorowski. Cole Lind, 65 total points on the year. That uh, is a career best in points, 17 goals, matched with a team-high 48 assists, finished fifth in the AHL with those 65 points. Captain Max McCormick, 60 points on the year, team-high 32 goals, paired with 28 assists. That was good for 12th in the AHL in total points. Max did hit a career high in goals with that 32 mark. Cameron Hughes, 57 points on the season, 25 goals and 32 assists. That is a career high in points for Cameron. Uh, this uh, episode's guest, Andrew Podorowski, in 60 games played, had 51 points. That is 15 goals paired with 36 assists. Is the fourth time in his storied career that he's hit that 50-point threshold. And I think I mentioned this a few weeks back. He had 49 points back in 2018. Lastly, certainly not least, rookie Shane Wright finished his season with 47 points, 22 goals, and 25 assists. Shane accomplished that in 59 games played. Between the pipes, Chris Drieger concluded his season with the Birds with a record of 24-7-7. That win mark was tied for 7th in the AHL. Goals against at 2.26 for Chris. That was good for 4th in the American Hockey League. Save percentage of 0.917. Also made the top 10 in that metric. 
he charted at ninth in the AHL. Alish Dezka, excellent season for Alish, 18-6-2 mark between the pipes, goals against of 2.48 and a save percentage right behind his teammate Chris Rieger, save percentage for Alish of .914. All right, friends, all that offered, all that prefaced, let's get to the visit with this episode's guest, Andrew Podorowski. All right, Firebirds friends, as offered at the onset of this episode of the Fire and Ice podcast, my guest for this show is a native of Williamsville, New York, ninth season of professional hockey, storied American Hockey League career, 420 points in 468 regular season games, also tacked on 63 more points in 68 playoff games. He's a two-time scoring champion in this league, a two-time Calder Cup champion, and a playoff MVP because everyone in hockey needs a nickname. His friends and teammates call him Potsy. Oh, and he also named his child after Jim Morrison. May have to query about that as we did last time. Welcome, Andrew Podorowski, back to the Fire and Ice podcast. Hello, Potsy. What's going on, Judd? Thanks for having me. Pleasure to have you back, man. Because you got some – we're, we're technically in playoff time, yes, but since there are several off days – Start you off with a few softballs, man. I don't know if you're having any more kids or plan to have more kids, but if you did, I don't know, maybe name one after Scotty Scheffler, or if it's a girl, maybe Nellie Corda. I mean, yeah, those two have been on fire lately in the golf scene, but uh, we are we're having a baby girl coming up here pretty soon, so the Potterowski household is about to get crazy. Congratulations, man. Since you have Morrison Potterowski, I think that the daughter – I want to say Janis Joplin, maybe. <laughs> we can toss it around. We haven't fully committed to a name yet, so uh, we're still bouncing a few ideas ideas around between us. But uh, we haven't revealed any secrets to anyone, so I can't give anything away. Okay, we'll keep that one on the down low for now. When is the uh, when is the baby due? By the way, due date is May fifteenth, but our son was a week early and. Uh, we just feel like she's going to be a little early as well, so it could be uh, could be coming up real quick. Okay, well then maybe it was ironic to have mentioned Scotty Scheffler, who of course now infamously was ready to ditch on his Masters win, and then his subsequent RBC win at Hilton Head, as his yeah. wife was expecting. I don't know the situation for you come the Calder Cup playoffs, Um if little Janice Joplin Podorowski comes into the world, I hope we'll still have number 22 on the ice, selfishly speaking. Yeah, I mean, we're going to, I think we're going to time it out pretty well here and hope that, you know, she comes on an off day <laughs> that we wouldn't have to miss any games. But, you know, obviously if if she were to go into labor and we, we had a game, I think I think the boys would be able to have my back for a game. And, and you know, if I miss a game, so be it. But uh, we got a pretty good team that could back us up. So I'll uh, be there to help Haley out. Obviously, because we don't have any family or anything here. But uh, then we're right back at it, back to work afterwards. It's not only uh, bipeds that uh, Andrew Podorowski cares about. I've been meaning to ask you this question for like a, a month, man. Uh, I think it was in mid-March, the uh, Potsy Puppy Palooza that took place uh, at Akershire Arena. Uh, what was that event all about? Uh, just helping out the, the dogs in need, and there's there's a lot of them, especially in the Valley. Uh, we worked with Palm Springs Animal Shelter and the Animal Samaritans, uh, who are both local shelters, not kill shelters in the area. And We actually got to go spend some time at the Palm Springs Animal Shelter and see what they're all about, see their facilities, and uh, help them out. We helped fundraise a little bit of money for them, and uh, – it goes back to my, uh, I mean, I've always loved loved animals, my wife the same, and it goes back to my days as a rookie when I was in Charlotte. I was roommates with Hayden Fleury, who's Cal Fleury's older brother, and one thing led to another, two young, dumb kids. We adopted a cat. Um, I'll say he adopted a cat because he filled out the paperwork and put his names and everything on it. And uh, one thing led to another, and we ended up with the cat. She's our cat with us uh, today, and we love her. And 
Uh, we're just always, you know, my family's growing up adopting dogs and, you know, there's so many dogs and animals that are in need. I think it's, uh, it's a thing that hits home for us and we love uh, being a part of that and trying to help out animals. I mean, who doesn't like animals? Come on. No, I, 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 there was a great video that the Firebirds put out and I hope and trust that some animals ultimately <laughs> did get adopted. Some dogs did, uh, puppies did get adopted as a result of that event you put on. Yeah, no, all those puppies got adopted, which was awesome. And I think we still next year, I want to build on it and try to bring some more of the bigger dogs who, you know, kind of need more help getting adopted. So getting them out in the community and, you know, seeing their faces. And even when we went there for a day, uh, you know, we were, I, I would love to go home with another dog, but even if people can help out fostering and whatnot. So um, everything kind of helps and, you know, it's just, it's fun to be a part of something and, you know, I kind of use our platform to, to, you know, help out in the community. I'm going to do a, or at least attempt a somewhat awkward transition. We'll call it from paw to puck here because we probably should start talking about a little bit of hockey, man. Uh, it's referenced earlier in the show and as you and I, uh, just touched upon a lot of days off after the Firebirds earned the uh, buy in the first round of the Pacific division playoffs. Could be talking about as many as like 10 days now between games. I did ask you the same question, so you'll suffer the reiteration about uh, I asked you the question in the, the post game after uh, after Sunday's a regular season closer uh, about spending that time, about how you and your teammates spend that time still keeping a, a competitive vibe, but at the same time also getting some rest. How, what's the happy balance there? Yeah, I think, you know, not having to play in a three-game series is is definitely really nice and use the time for guys who I said, you know, are a little banged up or injured, myself included. The, the extra rest definitely helps us, you know, uh, heal up and get ready more for game one once we do start. But um, I don't think it's too big of a deal. You know, we've gone through phases throughout this year, especially in the American League. You have times throughout the year where you go six, seven days without a game. So uh, it's just a little bit more than that. But We'll keep it competitive on the ice. We'll have a lot of, you know, hard practices, and our team is nothing short of competitive. So no matter what we're doing, whether, you know, it's on the ice, off the ice, whatever games we're playing or messing around with each other, we're super competitive. But uh, we're also provided the luxury of being in the Coachella Valley and having a lot of stuff to do off the ice, you know, to keep our minds relaxed, refreshed. So when we do get back to the rink, it's it's fun to be there and, you know, work hard and compete with our teammates. So uh, we'll kind of use that to our advantage, maybe get a little vitamin D here and there. And, uh, you know, once it's time to go, I think we'll be ready. We have a pretty determined squad this year. Ask Dan Bilesma uh, the same question and the same post-game presser about uh, his experiences with buys, whether as a player or coach. And he did reference that he'd had a couple, I believe, once when he was an assistant with Charlotte. He said there was a buy. I think he said once as a player, he also had a pretty substantial buy. But I don't know if I got the answer from him that there was like a perfect secret sauce, really, of how to spend that time and find the right balance. But it seems like from your answer that you gave me on Sunday and the one that you said just now, you feel pretty cozy and your teammates pretty, feel pretty cozy with that amount of time away from gameplay during what is the most important part of the season. Yeah, no, the vibes have surely ramped up in the room. We all kind of know it's go time now. This is the real season. This is where it counts. This is where guys get paid. This is where guys make names for themselves. All the above. And then ultimately, we all really want to win a championship and bring it back to the Valley. So uh, we had a pretty good run last year, but still a sour taste in our mouth. So, uh, you know, we're fortunate for the bye. We worked hard during the regular season to earn it. So we got to take advantage of it and then be ready to go. I want to touch upon a few follow-ups to uh, your answer. Great answer right there, by the way. First, I do want to make mention that one of the other questions, I was going to ask you this on Sunday, but knowing that I'd uh, have the chance to visit with you now, I thought I'd hold off. I did ask the question to Dan Bilesma, and he gave an answer that surprised me. Uh, the Firebirds, obviously, best record in the Pacific Division, best record in the Western Conference, most goals scored in the Western Conference, Fewest goals allowed in the Western Conference. The accolades abound. And yet when the AHL teams, the all AHL teams, the all rookie teams, various awards announced over the course of the past week, there'll be a few more still to come. Point being, Potsy, nary 
a Firebird was named to any of these teams. And I thought it might be something that Dan said, well, you know, hey, we had a great season. You know, congrats to those guys that got the awards. But that was not the answer he gave. He took exception, could tell, to the fact that there were no Firebirds named to those teams. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, I mean, I would I would say I'd put our roster and our individuals up against anyone who was on the list. I honestly didn't even look at the list. But uh, I think he told us this morning and before practice, he told us that same stat because none of us knew And we all kind of instantly responded with the same answer, which was good, which is kind of our playoff motto right now. And it's kind of just no matter what happens, whether it's an up or down. I don't know if you've ever seen the Jocko Wilmick. uh, He has that speech (laughs) and the answer just is good. So like it's something we'll deal with. That's motivation. Then, you know, if people don't want to recognize the talent that we have in our room, good. Like we'll use it to our advantage and, and motivate us to, you know, push even harder and, and prove everybody wrong because at the end of the day you know the team who's holding the trophy at the end of the year that's that's really what matters so uh you know kind of use that as a little bulletin board material for us but um uh, i don't think anyone's really going to lose much sleep over it but um you know definitely light the fire a little bit more i mean you've received numerous awards i referenced several of them when introducing you i have to imagine that they do matter, though, those individual accolades that reflect on your team as well? Yeah, I mean, they're nice and all, but I would say the things that, you know I'm most proud of in my career are my, my two call their cup rings, and, and that's kind of what people will remember at the end of the, at the, end of the day. So uh, I think if we, you know, we come home and we bring a call their cup back to the Valley, that's, that's what people would remember a lot more than you know, a couple individual awards. Friends are tuning into the Fire and Ice podcast presented by Desert Willow Golf Resort. My guest is Firebird Center, Andrew Podorowski. One of the things, Potsy, that uh, you referenced that I wanted to follow up on is the magnified stage, the illuminated stage of the AHL playoffs and what it means not just to the teams, but to the individual players as well. I mean, I think it's an opportunity, whatever or wherever a player may be in his career, whether uh, he's, you know, like some of the 19 or 20 year old guys, whether he's guys, whether a guy like yourself that has been around and had a ton of success, is it an opportunity? Are the AHL playoffs an opportunity to further showcase your skills? Absolutely. I think, you know, you see every year guys uh, have good playoffs. It earns them big contracts, earns them, opportunities in the NHL you know both teams I've been a part of and even last year's team guys you know if you go that far in the playoffs that says a lot about your team and a lot about you as an individual guys always get paid pretty well um, you know after these Calder Cup runs so uh, there's definitely a lot to showcase a lot to be a part of and um, it's it's just really hard and it's you know it's hard to stress or um, explain it enough but you know as professional hockey there's what 32 teams in our league and uh, you know it's it's really really hard to be the last team standing it's it's so competitive as all professional sports are as you know and being the second league behind the nhl uh to be that last team standing is just a really really hard thing to do so uh we know the task in hand and and uh you know we're, we're really excited to get going is it a sense that there are more scouts at games, which you saw at a lot of playoff games last year? There are more GMs. There's more people watching AHL TV, or is it just like all of the above? You guys are all well, you know, burst on the fact that there's just more eyeballs on those games. All of the above, but to be honest, I don't think I've ever really thought of it as that. You know, as a player, I've never thought about. Oh, there's more GMs playing today. It's more so like I really want to win this game. I want to win this series, and you know I want to win the cup. So uh, if, if we all are thinking, you know, who's watching, who's doing this, you know, it's tough to really be focused on the game and and winning if that's what you're worried about. So I don't think many guys focus on that too much, and you know we're focused on pretty much just winning, and that's what it's all about. And when I was a rookie, I remember one of the one of our veterans stepped up before playoffs started and said. You know, just because we made the playoffs, like, I don't want you young guys to take this for granted. Um, he's like, this is my whatever, 10th, 12th year playing professional hockey, and I've never made the playoffs. So, you know, you might, this might be the last time you ever are on a team that makes the playoffs. You could go the rest of your career and not make the playoffs. So 
don't take it for granted, you know, like let's work hard and let's make something special. So that's kind of always stuck with me. And, you know, once the playoff hockey and the, you know, the flip or the switch flips from the regular season to the postseason, uh, you start to get that intensity and, you know, don't take it for granted. And, you know, this team, especially we've, we've done so well in the regular season and had such a nice run, but none of it really matters. You know, up until this point, we've put ourselves in a position with a bye, but, uh, you know, we got to go out there and win hockey games now and, and really make it count. Is that a message that you have bestowed to the younger Firebirds now, that you're the veteran and there's these 19, 20, 21-year-old guys? Uh, I think it could be said at the right time. You know, if, if I thought it was appropriate or, you know, I thought guys were taking it for granted. But, you know, so far our team, I think we've just instilled this competitive culture throughout the locker room that everybody's bought into already and they they everybody knows what's at stake and I don't think anybody on our team uh, is taking anything for granted so um, you know maybe it's just something to say you know to remind guys but um, like I said I think our our culture that we've created here through the last two years speaks for itself and everybody who's in that room knows what it takes and uh, and knows to be ready to go. One of the things I detailed on uh, this episode before I brought you in, some listeners might say I excessively detailed it, but I felt it was it was warranted going through the potential opponents that the Firebirds could face in the first round. There are four of them. First line, I'll really count Calgary as number four. I just don't think that's going to happen against Tucson. That's my opinion. As far as the other three, uh, Colorado, Abbotsford, Bakersfield, I asked you this in the post-game press conference, and I knew you weren't going to answer. So I'm going to phrase it this way. You I don't have, have an answer for you now, though. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Then I'll ask the same question. I'll try it again the first time around the same way. And I'll, and I'll put all, all four of those teams. If, is there one that you might prefer to face? I would, I would say Bakersfield. And for the reason being is that we would start at home. And then the, also the other reason being is it's not a long flight so that if my wife does go into labor, it's pretty easy for me to get back. So I think those are two pretty safe reasons why. But I just hope there's not a big, big headline out on TSN or something saying that I don't want to face Bakersfield. <laughs> I don't know. The Fire and Ice podcast has growing reach, Potsy. Now up to what downloads in, I think, 26 different countries. So. There we'll we see. Go. Maybe that maybe that one is going to go viral. <laughs> but and one of the things I did detail is that yeah, the Bakersfield series would be the only one that would be a two-two-one format with the first two games at home. Uh, any of the other three opponents would result in the two-three format that we saw against Colorado in the divisional semifinal last year. And I phrase it as an educated guess. I feel pretty safe in saying that the Firebirds would again choose to have the home ice advantage for game five playing the first two games on the road uh if you had your druthers would you do you would would you make that same choice play the first two on the road and have the next three at home you like that choice or would you go the other way around no i'd go two on the road all day and then three at home you just gotta go on the you just gotta go on the road and split and then you have a best of three at home so I, I think, you know, Calgary did it last year to us when they were the upper hand and we went in soul game one and then all of a sudden, you know, they're they're chasing the entire series there. So, um, you know, I think it worked to our advantage and I think our whole team's pretty on board with that. Um, so, and we've been a pretty good road team all year. So uh, knowing that you really only have to go in there and get one is, is huge, but um, I think our record's been good enough that we could go somewhere and, you know, maybe steal two, so. Um, as much as we love playing at home, you know, it's it's nice to get those first two over with and then be home to finish it out. I think when I asked Troy Bodie uh, that question last year, he also emphasized that the ability to have a potential deciding game on your home ice was a massive factor in choosing that format. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think if you're choosing the other way, you're you're just thinking too hard about it. I don't think it's it's that hard of a decision, really. Um, we referenced uh, you and, and some of your teammates. I don't like to get into, and I, I've never done this with with whether it be the Firebirds or any sport I've I've covered, Major League Baseball, the PGA Tour, the NBA. I've never had any interest in talking about 
contracts or length or numbers or amounts that just personally never interested me. However, what is notable about your group, your core group now of veterans that has that have been with the Firebirds for what is now nearly two years of magical hockey that we've been very spoiled, obviously, that we've enjoyed. Um, you know, yourself, John Hayden, Cole Lynn, Max McCormick, uh, Cameron Hughes, uh, Jimmy Schultz, Chris Drieger, uh, been here both years, and all these veteran players that have gotten the franchise so far in such a short window of time. Really, the only veteran guy that um, is signed for next year is uh, Gustav Olofsson. And it just made me wonder that amongst yourself and these other veterans that have been here for two years, if you guys have ever broached the fact or talked about it, like, look, this has been a unique and special thing. Like, let's really advantage of it because, hey, come come next year and the way that the AHL works, the way the veteran rule works, we don't need to get into overt detail about that, but Let's just be honest, man. This probably ain't going to happen again with this same core group that we've so enjoyed. Yeah, I think that's just the nature of the business of professional sports. And I think it's another thing that I've, I've heard, you know, murmured from veterans throughout my career in playoffs that, you know, this is the last time that this group is ever going to be able to play together. There's never, you know, a second year where the same exact team goes out on the ice for another year or so. You know, we you love this group. You love the group you're a part of. Like, let's go make the most of it. So I think everybody kind of knows that one as well. And uh, that's definitely in our heads when we're going out there and playing. And I think we're a super close group out there uh, off the ice. And that's a huge part of our success on the ice. And, you know, we all love each other, love hanging out together and doing everything together. So uh, knowing that it's the last dance, if you want to call it, every year, um, you know, it just gives you a little extra more to go out there and, and want to win and be a part of something special with that group. So, uh, you know, the championships I've been a part of, like those guys are brothers for life and it's stuff that you'll always remember. So um, I'm definitely down to keep making memories like that and, and sharing them uh, with these guys because uh, this group's a lot of fun to be a part of and coming to the rink every day, it's nothing short of a lot of laughs. And it's definitely one of the most unique groups I've been a part of uh we're we're definitely crazy off the ice and, and love to chirp and give it to each other and it just makes for uh, some good camaraderie around the room given that affinity and given that camaraderie combined with all of these i don't want to say off days because obviously you guys are still practicing working working out doing all your stuff but non-game days you take some advantage to uh to get together with these guys and have some fun whether it be some golf, whether it be convening uh, with your better halves, having people over for dinner, anything like that? 100%. I think yeah, I think there was maybe four or five groups that went out and played golf together today. Uh, we had a group played out yesterday. You know, we have a little dinner party tomorrow with like six couples. Uh, I think we're going to have a team dinner together before playoffs even start where everybody goes, staff included. Um, you know, even the girls, they all get together and do stuff. If we're going out for a team dinner, all the girls get together. You know, they're part of the families. They're our big support system as well. So um, it's cool just to see everybody is just one big family and uh, all this team bonding stuff. I think the teams that I've been a part of that are really close off the ice have success on the ice. And, you know, everybody says it and it might be cliche, but it's so true. And, you know, if you guys want to, or if you want to work together hard off the ice and you trust each other and, you know, want the most out of each other, it really shows up in the games and you can really lean on each other to, you know, trust everyone's going to be in the right spots. So it's definitely really fun to be a part of. I'll ask you this uh, lastly, uh, lastly, rather today, Potts, and you'll suffer me if I draw it out a little bit. I asked the same question to, uh, to Troy Bodie and we did an interview about uh, two weeks ago. Last year I was, there was a word that was in my head as the season became more and more special and the playoffs became more and more enthralling. And I waited until the exit interviews to even mention it to, uh, to any player. This is just something that I, I personally felt and held close that the Calder cup championship, that it was destined, that it felt destined to be that the entire journey and everything you guys did in the new in the new building and all the exciting games, it just felt like it was destiny to me. And I 
I mentioned that to Troy a couple of weeks ago. I'd never said that to him. And I told him, look, hey, I know it's your job and the player's job to, to win hockey games. It's our job to come up with storylines and narratives. But I said, for this second season, given how well you guys have played, given how I've seen you come in to these post-game pressers, very, very disappointed when you have lost the rare occasion that you've lost. And when you've won, generally coming in there to speak with us, having some swagger. And it just occurred to me that as a different narrative, I said, is there something like vengeance? Is there something like unfinished business for that final game of last season that these guys are extremely motivated to grab that? And he wouldn't latch on to a narrative, but I could tell from reading his face, and I'm curious to hear what you say, if there is a narrative that you guys hold something close to what I just described. Yeah, I mean, I can you can relate it to so many different things, but I've said a million times how competitive we are, and you know, to lose how we did in that fashion last year, like that's a gut shot that kills us inside. And the amount of times over the summer, you know, I see friends, family, whoever, random people be like, "Oh, uh, how'd your season go?" or "Oh, I saw what happened. Like that sucks." And you know, it gets brought up almost on the daily in conversation. And you know, as a competitor, it, it it kills you inside to know you're one goal away from winning a Calder Cup and how cool it would have been to win in the first season and everything. So uh, that definitely burns inside, and I think it burns inside a lot of us, if not all of us who were here last year, and um, it just gives us the extra motivation. And, you know, we can, if you want to mention that, we could say, you know, we lost Game 7 Calder Cup Finals in OT. Good. You know, we learned from it. Like, we're going to use that as our motivation. Um you know, not to get like all crazy on you, but that's that's kind of what it is. And um, nobody really remembers second place. So we went that far and did all that. Like it was amazing for the Valley. Don't get me wrong. And we've created something really special here. But at the end of the day, you no, know, none of us got a ring from it. And um, we we really want to bring that trophy back. So uh, it definitely it definitely feels the fire a lot more. And, and we know this year uh, that you know, our regular season isn't going to mean a whole lot unless we go out and do that again. So I'll let you label it whatever word you want, but uh, definitely, definitely burn. We have that burning passion inside to bring home a trophy. And um, the the last year, what happened is still has a sour taste in our mouths and can remember that uh, like it was yesterday. So uh, got to just use that as motivation and learn from it and, and uh, move forward. Hey, you guys put some very, very special banners in Akershire Arena that hang aloft in the rafters. But I think we are all in concert that, number one, very much hope that you and I are still talking Firebird hockey about two months from now. And number two, I think there's a there's a different banner, another new banner that we want to see hanging uh, about two plus months from now. So, hey, man. Absolutely. Uh, as always, Potsy, so appreciative of your time. So enthused for the playoffs get, to get underway. As Tom Petty said, the, the waiting is the hardest part. So we kind of have this this downtime and then a few likely yeah. or potential away games to see how the other series respectively play out. Could be a little while before we get Firebird Hockey back to Akashur Arena. But I have no doubt that the Birds Barn, 10,000 plus strong, is going to be ready to rock by the time you guys are dressed in playing playoff hockey in Palm Desert. Yep, I love bragging to all my friends how cool it is playing in front of our fans and, you know, how the Akashur is rocking every night. So I expect nothing less this year in playoffs. And our fans definitely have high expectations for us now, and that's another good thing that we want to fulfill them. So, um, you know, we'll be ready, and I hope they're ready too. So it'll be a fun run this year. Appreciate your time, man. Look forward to the playoffs. Thanks, Potsy. Thanks, Chad. All right, Firebirds friends, it's going to take us out for this episode of the Fire and Ice podcast presented by Desert Willow Golf Resort. So appreciative of your time, your interest, your ears, your continued support of this endeavor. I know collective enthusiasm abounds as we enter the Calder Cup playoffs here in this second season. 
Equal appreciation goes to this episode's guest, Andrew Podorowski, and of course the presenting sponsor of this endeavor, Desert Willow Golf Resort, just a couple miles, I think 3.4 specifically, away from the bird's home ice of Akrasure Arena, home to the Firecliff and Mountain View courses respectively. Get those tee times online at desertwillow.com, and when you're poking around on there, don't forget to check out the upcoming Memorial Day weekend City of Palm Desert Championship takes place over two days on the Mountain View course. It's a team event with flights open to Palm Desert residents and non-city residents alike. Added programming note here, you might remember this from last year. Per these episodes and the Firebirds Insider articles, you can find those online at cbfirebirds.com for each upcoming respective playoff series There will be a series preview that I'll be penning for the upcoming playoff series in the divisional semifinal. There will be a special playoff podcast. And then we'll see where it goes for every and each subsequent potential playoff series. More articles to come. Many, many more podcasts hopefully to come over the course of what we hope will be two more months of Firebirds hockey. Thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. Follow along these Calder Cup playoffs. We'll see who the, who the birds are going to play in that first round. And then eventually, very much look forward to seeing you back on the birds' home ice of Akrasher Arena for some playoff hockey. Until then, and always, remember, one valley, one team, rising together.